Okay, guys, good morning. Welcome back, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just hanging in there for another uh, minute and a half, pretty much, until we get to 8.30, and then we can start uh, the first review session today for the upcoming <clears throat> final exam. But I hope you all have a really good weekend and a nice, uh, solid morning so far. And I'm almost ready to get going. Good morning, Roxana, Ashley, Monica, Andres, Nicole. Good to see everybody today. <clears throat> hey, Delilah. <clears throat> John, Daniel, hey there. Rohin, Brianna, Jesse, welcome everyone. <clears throat> hey there guys, Ashley, and Caleb, and everyone else. So, all right, we're now pretty much there at 8.30, so good to see you guys. Good morning, everybody. So, uh, yeah, if you look at the schedule, you all know that today and uh, Thursday, these last two class meetings, live streams, are just about review sessions that we can use to go over the, uh, the final exam study guide. I distributed the study guide last week, um, I think Thursday or Friday, through, uh, through Titanium to everybody. So I would just ask you guys that are here, to uh, pull up your copy if you don't already have it out. So you can go back into the um, announcements tab or into your own uh, inbox from Outlook and you can just find the uh, original announcement with the document attached. Make sure to open that because that's gonna guide us through the, uh, the review sessions. And um, in the same way that we did the midterm review session, I kind of like it when it's more student driven, meaning that I like it when you guys try to provide the information and the answers but I will insert myself as needed when I think that uh, I need to clear something up, um, expand on anything, or correct any information that's coming out. But that's basically it. We don't have any more lectures. We're all done with looking at the book and studying it for the first time. Now it's just review. So um, also, don't forget, um, you know, your, your second, um, or sorry, I meant to say your fourth and final homework assignment um, has, has been assigned, and you should be making sure to get that into me before the uh, official due date, which I believe is end of day tomorrow. So you still have a little bit of time working on that, but make sure that you get it in. <clears throat> um, I've had some different students ask me questions about formatting and things like that. Just one last time to be perfectly clear about it. Um, you're gonna have a document that basically contains um, fundamentally information about just what show you watched, what channel it was, what time and date that it aired, and what chant uh, and sorry so you've got to have station in information time and date name of show and then you're gonna have to have like a table of contents essentially which um, okay Violetta you're asking about the date and time of the final yeah I'll tell you exactly so um, for us it is the 20th yes May 20th from 9 to 10 50 a.m. so that's gonna be Thursday of finals week nine days from today um, and that's exactly correct. So you're right, Violetta. That's also printed on the syllabus, so you can refer to that if, if you forget this information. But yes, it is Thursday, May 20th, 9 to 10.50 a.m. Um, what I was saying, though, about homework four, just while we're all together for the moment, just some basic details to remember that I think I've said before, but just to remind you, you have to have one document that lists the uh, name of the show, the channel that it was aired on, and the time and date that it was broadcast, okay? And then you have to have a table of contents. The table of contents is just gonna basically list each story that was covered within the viewing window that you watched, and it's just gonna show the time signature with like minutes and seconds attached to each individual story item. And then apart from that, you have your analytical report, which is like a two, to, two page or so um, written analysis where you try to find examples of course concepts like fallacies, rhetoric, um, any kind of misleading editing tactics or things that shape the viewer's experience that could be misleading or subject to criticism. And um, 
that two page part that's like the analysis part it could just be 12 point font double spaced um, and that's about it if you need more than two pages that's also it's also okay to exceed the minimum uh, or the suggested guidance of two pages okay so I think that's everything just to kind of make sure that's clear one last time <clears throat> And to those that are trying to struggle to find something like a television show or those that don't have cable, if you only have internet access, it's okay to watch, I guess, something that has been re-uploaded to the internet but that was originally broadcast as a TV um, news show. And make sure that it's not any kind of satirical uh, news or comedy, even though sometimes that is interesting and informative, like so not The Daily Show or um, Last Night with John Oliver or something. And then... Um, the other thing is make sure that it's a story, or sorry, that it's a news show that has like a variety of stories and not just like one big um, topic that they cover the whole time. Because otherwise you wouldn't have any sense of like the priorities of the broadcaster, like what kind of uh, time they allot to the various stories in terms of their degree of importance or news value. <clears throat> okay, so that's just some things about homework four. And as you guys know, the only other thing other than that is the uh, final exam. So yeah. Um, Let's go on then and try and get into the study guide. I have my copy pulled up. I make, I want, I'd like you guys to pull your own copy up as well. And when you look at the study guide, you'll notice that we have uh, all of the information from the first half of the class that's already been um, provided on the midterm study guide. And then I just tacked on a second half to that same uh, document, which contains all the topics and information from the second half of the semester since the midterm. So we have two class periods to go over all this stuff today and Thursday. And uh, what do you guys think about the order? Like, shall we start back at the beginning um, with the initial mat material before the midterm and then do the other stuff on Thursday? Um, or do you want to do it in the reverse order, like today starting with the stuff after the midterm and then Thursday looking back at the uh, earlier material? I don't know. It doesn't make really too much difference, but which of the two options do you prefer? Uh, Tiandra, maybe you can tell me your view or anybody else. Shall we start at the very beginning or after the midterm? Beginning, beginning, okay. Then let's go ahead and do that. All right then, so we're gonna start with the very first couple of uh, questions and we'll just try to go down through this list. Now here's the thing everybody, uh, <clears throat> it is helpful when we are efficient with time, okay? So that means that you have to support the class. That means that you have to try your best to get these questions out there so that we can move on to the next one because we can only go over as much information as you guys can provide answers for them in the time window that we have. So I had a different class, a Monday, Wednesday section that to be honest could have done a little better job getting through the first half of the questions yesterday in part one of our review session. It's like a classic example of diffusion of responsibility, like a lot of people waiting for somebody else to type something so that they didn't have to get activated, and it made it very slow because I refused to give the answers until somebody writes something. So uh, that's how it's going to be now. So do your best to kind of snap back and give these answers fast so we can move on. Okay, so a question. What is a good or a bad critical thinker? Somebody tell me that. Type it in the chat, and once we know, then we'll go from there. So we're starting with this, the first question. What is a good critical thinker or a bad critical thinker? So we're going through the topics in the order listed from the whole study guide starting at the beginning. So this takes us way back to the first day. If you have your notes with you, you'd open the notes to the very first page, the first stuff that we ever talked about. So what is a good critical thinker? And also, what is a bad critical thinker? <clears throat> it's obviously like a core definition and topic for the whole class, so let's get this one out. <clears throat> okay, so Delilah. You say, a good critical thinker, a type of person who will not believe a claim unless it is based on good evidence or some good arguments. And um, there's also a second part to it, though. Like, that's, that's correct. But don't forget the other aspect of, like, when you're making claims. How about that? So can either of you guys or anybody else tell me the second portion? A good critical thinker will not believe claims unless they're based on good arguments or evidence. And when they make claims to other people, like when you're the person not receiving, but sending out information to others. What does a good critical thinker do then? <clears throat> Just want to make sure to get the full definition out. Okay, so Angel, you say, uh, a person that will not believe a claim unless it's based on good evidence or argument, and when making claims to others, 
providing good evidence or arguments to support the claim. Exactly. Okay, good. Yes. So um, that's what critical thinkers, that are good critical thinkers are able to do. They can defend their own claims with reasonable evidence and arguments. So they don't just say stuff that they can't back up. And at the same time, when people make claims to them, they don't just accept it without question. They say, well, okay, what's the reasons behind it? What's the argument or the evidence behind it? And only if there is strong evidence, arguments, et cetera, would they believe it. Okay, now um, to the other side, though, what is a bad critical thinker? Since we've said what a good one is, bad is quite easy to, dis to explain because it's just sort of the opposite. But maybe you put it in the chat and then it'll be on this record. See, that's good to have the chat, right? Because it's like a kind of permanent record of the information. Okay, so bad. A person that will believe claims that are not based on good evidence or good arguments, and when making claims to others, they don't provide good evidence or arguments to support them. Exactly. Okay, so good critical thinkers need evidence to believe stuff, and they make sure that they package evidence together with the claims they make. But when you're a bad critical thinker, it's like you either don't care about the evidence or you're just not very good at determining what it is because a bad critical thinker believes information that's not based on any kind of solid reasons or evidence. And they also make claims to other people that are wild, that are baseless, that are unfounded, and then they can't even tell you what the evidence would be. Okay, so we want to be the better critical thinkers, not the worst, and that means that we want to try and move towards that initial uh, definition standard, to be the people that only believe things based on good evidence and that can defend our claims with evidence. Okay, so we continue from there. I'm asking next, what is an argument? Now, we're asking about what is an argument in the logical sense of the word, you know, like, um, like a logical argument, not my parents yelling at each other and stuff like that. So in the formal sense of logic and critical thinking, Yoletta, you say it is an attempt to defend a claim through logical reasoning. Yes, and then you say it consists of one conclusion and other sentences are premises. Okay, so this is all correct generally, but... Um, you haven't said like how many sentences at a minimum an argument has to have. You kind of indirectly say it though by saying that there must be one conclusion and you say other sentences, um, which is fair. But let's say how many sentences at minimum must there be? So there's a set of two or more, right? A set of two or more, well, no, Violetta, not three, because you can have a minimum of one premise and one conclusion. It's true though that in many arguments there are more than one premise, but it's also not limited to two. Okay, so the right thing to say, Violetta, is this, what you see the other students writing. An argument is a set of two or more, or more, like or more could be more, but it has to be at least two. And in the set of two or more sentences, you have one that is the conclusion, and then all the others except for, except for it are called premises. Um, good. So a set of two or more sentences where one is the conclusion and the rest are premises that support the conclusion. And Violetta, it was very good, the first thing you also said where... Overall, an argument is an attempt to defend the claim through reasoning. Now, um, next of all, let's talk about those parts of an argument and get into the details of that. So what is the definition of a conclusion of an argument? What is the role of a conclusion in an argument? Which piece is it? It's the part, it's the statement, it's the sentence that you're trying to what? Let me know about the conclusion. And then after that, we'll talk about the premises. <clears throat> okay, good. So Violetta, yes. Um, the claim that you're trying to prove to be true, that is the conclusion. Yes, that's right. And good morning, Yelka. Welcome back. Okay, so the conclusion is the statement you're trying to prove. You're trying to show that it's true. Now, what are the premises? How do they serve in the argument? What is their role? So you've got a conclusion. You're trying to prove that. But what are the premises, and how do they connect to the conclusion? <clears throat> Yes, very much so. Okay, good, Nicole and others. The uh, premises, they're the reasons or the evidence that give support to the conclusion. So they are the uh, statements that are supposed to give a reason to believe the conclusion. That's right. Yes, their claims. Well, n n no, sorry, Ashley, wrong. They're not the claims that you're trying to prove to be true. The conclusion is the only claim that you're trying to prove to be true. And the premises are like reasons that you give which are supposed to be supportive of the conclusion. Um, so it's only the conclusion you're trying to prove to be true. The premises are assumed as true um, in terms of being evidence for that conclusion. Okay, so let's make sure we all understand that you're trying to prove the conclusion. The premises are just evidence for it. But there's one thing that you're trying to prove in an argument, not five, six, seven, or two, or three. One claim is the conclusion. The bottom line is the only thing you're trying to prove, and everything else is evidence for that. Okay, so next. Um, 
Well, you're trying to make proof of a conclusion in an argument. You're trying to prove that it's true. Tell me, though, what does it mean for anything to be true? What does it mean for a sentence to be a true sentence? Let me hear about the definition of truth. <clears throat> so that's next. Okay, so good, Nicole and Tiandra. Um, when what a sentence says matches the facts of reality. Good. So if you have a sentence, it can be true or false. What makes the difference is the facts, whether the facts line up with what the sentence says or not. Can anybody here write out some sentence that is true? Write out a sentence which does match the facts of reality. Let me see something that's true. So we know how to apply this concept to a real example. What's something true? There's so many true things. It's everywhere, all around us, but something easy to point out that's true. <clears throat> So, Violetta, you say humans live on Earth. Yeah, that's true enough. Even though I guess there's a couple that are out there in the space station right now. They're not on the planet, but, you know, astronauts, they were born on Earth anyway. So, fair enough. Today is Tuesday, May 11th. Yeah, Nicole, I guess it is for the moment. But, you know, when, you read, when you're watching this video later, it's not going to be true. You're going to be watching this video, looking at it for a review, and then that same example won't be true anymore. But anyway, yeah. Kobe Bryant, yes, he did die. Too bad, right? five-time champion, um, you know, out there in a the helicopter with his daughter. Tragic thing, but it did happen, so that's true. Sun is the center of our, uh, not so much galaxy, actually, but rather solar system. Galaxy is the Milky Way, which is a constellation of a whole bunch of different um, stars. But right, in our local cosmos, the solar system we are in, the eight, whatever, or nine planets, forget about Pluto, how it's been classified now, but the, the planets orbit the sun and not the other way around. Okay, good. So those are all fair examples. I'm just asking you for some quick recognition of how to use this concept in applied cases. Okay, good. So then next, let me ask, what's a belief? What is it to believe a sentence or a statement? So truth is when whatever the thing says matches the world and the facts. Uh, but what is it to believe a statement or sentence? Tell me about a belief. Okay, good, Nicole. Belief. When a person thinks that a sentence is true. Yeah, so two people can disagree about one sentence. Um, like maybe the question is whether someone is a murderer. And, you know, the prosecutor says, I think they are. And the defense attorney says, no, I don't think they are. That's just, I think, a mix-up, bad, false identification. So the, if the proposition is Jones is the killer, um, you know, maybe his family members don't think he did it, but certain members of the jury do. So they have different beliefs about whether they think it's really true. Um, maybe somebody was claimed to have cheated on their partner and they deny it, but some people think they're lying. And so some people believe their statement that they did not cheat and other people think, no, that's false. They really did. So belief when you, you know, um, think that the statement matches reality and Beliefs can sometimes be incorrect, but we try our best, and that's why we want to be good critical thinkers, because that's going to help us have more true beliefs rather than false for the most part, even though none of us are perfect, and sometimes we will make occasional errors in judgment. Okay, so I'm asking next about what are some conclusion indicator words. These are words that you would either see or read um, or hear just before someone states the conclusion of an argument. So uh, what are some of these words, words that indicate a conclusion? Okay, good. So we have Tiandra, therefore, thus, so, hence, in conclusion, the classical Latin ergo, consequently, is another possibility. Um, I think that's a pretty good sampling right there that the three students have written. Um, hard to think of too many others. QED is a very obscure one. Um, uh, yeah, consequently, it follows that. Um, and all of those are fine. Yeah, most of the cases, usually people use therefore, thus, hence, or so, um, but all the others are fair game as well. Okay, next, what are some premise indicator words? Words which uh, indicate that you're about to hear evidence for something. So like evidence words. Uh, okay, good, Nicole. So because, since, due to the fact uh, given that, granted that, on account of. That's that's very well. All that is good. Um, you know, so suppose that someone was trying to raise the allegation of cheating against their partner. And they say, you know what, since I saw these texts, or because, um, you know, 
I can smell perfume on your clothes or given the fact that um, you were out all night last night and didn't tell me where you were, you know, therefore I think cheating. So these are things that are stated in preface of reasons. Um, if you thought that someone was guilty of a crime and let's say you're the prosecutor, you talk to the jury and say, look, given the fact that his fingerprints are on this weapon and since we know he had a motive to kill this man, it's therefore obvious beyond a reasonable doubt that he's the killer. So you're trying to give reasons. You're saying because of this, since that, due to this fact, given that fact, therefore I, I have this conclusion. Okay, so good guys. Next, let's talk about what's um, what is an imperative sentence? Somebody can tell me what's an imperative. Give an example. Imperatives. What are those? <clears throat> What are imperatives? Okay, good. Yeah, Nicole, they are commands. It's any type of command that you could issue uh, verbally or in writing. Can somebody um, provide such a case, uh, uh, an imperative here in the live stream? Close that book. Get out of the car. Yeah, okay, good. These are a few random examples. Things you might say to a person to give a directive about what they're supposed to do or what you want them to do. Open the door. Um, <clears throat> close the door, get on the ground, um, run, move, um, don't move, you know, all that stuff. Okay, then um, what are some, what's an interrogative? Um, what kind of sentence is that? And what could be some examples of an interrogative sentence? <clears throat> they are questions, yes. And how are you today? That would be a fair question. Um, what day is it? Um, where am I? Um, who's the president? Where was I born? I don't know. These are questions that probably people should know the answers to, but randomly I'm just throwing them out there. Um, where's the bathroom? Um, uh, which way is my classroom? You know, questions, anything that ends with a question mark. So that's, I think, a pretty easy one. Okay, then what is an assertoric sentence? Assertoric sentence. Hmm. What do you think? What's that one? Okay, good. Yeah, it's a sentence that is either true or false. As we sometimes say, it's just any sentence that does have a truth value. So it's a claim. Can anybody write out some type of assertion that is, you know, in this category? something that could be evaluated to be true or false. In some cases, we might not know whether it's actually true or false, but we know that it has to have one of those two truth values. So like, what could be some examples? This is the most widespread category of all sentences that are used, especially in logic. Um, um, so this is the main kind. We want to for sure know examples. Yoletta, what does that say? I'm just confused. EMP, am I just not catching a reference that everyone else knows. Maybe you could tell me more. But uh, I'm confused by the example, sorry. So uh, the Empire State Building is in New York. There you go, I got it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, the Empire State Building is in New York, so that's a true statement. But even if we had said the Empire State Building is in California, that would have been an assertion. It just would have been a false one. So it would have still fallen in the same category. No, not to worry. Nicole, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Yes, this is a mathematical truth. Um, Let's see, Biden is the president, um, COVID-19 is uh, raging all over India, um, we're the third planet from the sun. Um, these are all assertions. They're assertions of fact, they're all true, but also false assertions are assertions, they're just false. You know, So if I say to you that I'm 100 years old, that would be a claim, it would be a false claim. If I say to you that the United States was founded in 1920, that would also be false but it would be an assertion at least. So anyway, something that can be claimed uh, as a true or a false sentence is an assertion, and those are the only types of propositions that are used as premises and conclusions uh, in arguments. Okay, <clears throat> so next I'm asking this, define the topic of a deductively valid argument, and this is a key question because I'm, I, I will put it on the, on the final. It's definitely going to be on the final because it's too important to, to ever forget. So let's know though. Yeah, good, Nicole. So with a deductively valid argument, if all the premises are true, then in that case, the conclusion must be true also. 
Um, so if you have premises that guarantee the conclusion would be true if they were, that would be a deductively valid argument. Um, so let's see here. I'm trying to think of two quick examples, one valid, one not valid. Um, <clears throat> Maybe I'll just make one valid and sound and the other not sound. Okay, so all dogs are white. Rover is a dog. So therefore, Rover is white. Okay, and then how about um, another argument below here, which says all fish can swim. Um, a trout is a fish. So therefore, sorry, I'm just going to circle this one to kind of mark it off distinct from the one below. Um, so therefore, second argument below here, a trout can swim. Sorry, the ink is not ideal right now, but that's uh, what it says. Now, um, to the top argument here, it says all dogs are white, Rover is a dog, and therefore Rover is white. Let me ask you, is this valid? The top argument. No, and not to worry, AJ, good to see you. Uh, question for now is this. Looking at this example, all dogs are white, Rover is a dog, so Rover is white. Let me know, valid or not valid? Sorry, Nicole, wrong. It is valid. It's valid. Okay? It is valid. So stop right there. Also same, John. It's valid. Why are you saying it's not valid? Why do you think it's not valid? If the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. That's clear. Yeah, it's valid, but it's not sound. Exactly, Gabriel. So let's not misunderstand the topic of what validity means. Why do some have the sense, the first instinct, that it's not valid? I just want to know why you think so, because it's uh, two premises. The first one says all dogs are white, okay? And then it says Rover is just the name of a dog. So if all dogs are white and Rover is a dog, then it does follow that Rover is white. How could it not? I mean, all of them are white. And so if he's one of those things that are all white, then he's white also. It's valid. But it's not sound. Good. And the reason that it's not sound, now we can ask about that. How about this one, though? Okay, tell me the status of the bottom one so we have a contrast. What about the one below? Is this valid? It's also valid, I'll just tell you. But what's the difference between the two? Okay, now we can really make sure to know this. This one is not sound. But this one is sound. So what's the definition of soundness? Let's hear that. Tell, someone tell me the definition of a sound argument now. <clears throat> What's the definition of sound? <clears throat> and then that will clarify why they have a different status, these two. And that will also help clarify uh, why some are confusing, I think, the definition of validity with soundness. So sound means deductively valid argument with all true premises. Okay, good. So now tell me, Nicole, John, or anybody, why this is valid but it's not sound. Why isn't it sound, this argument on top? Why isn't it sound? Since you know the definition of soundness, you can tell me that this fails to be sound for what reason? It's valid logically just in terms of form, but it is unsound based on what reason? Why is it not sound, the, the top argument? Many of you, Gabriel, Delilah, others have said it's not sound. So just help uh, enlighten us why it isn't. <clears throat> in reference to the top argument about dogs all being white and whatever rover. Why is that not sound? What am I to make of the long pause? 
does that mean 100% of people don't know why it is not sound? Come on, you have to know it. I mean, that's for sure something you will be questioned on. <clears throat> but you have to tell me right now why it's not sound. Or do you not know why it's not sound? Well, look it up, find the information, and we'll get to it. Not all the premises are true. Okay, good. Which, which one's false? Let's just be very precise. Which one is a false statement that's not true to the world? <laughs> Gabriel, you say, is your internet broken? Uh, I hope it isn't. I can see your comment. Can you hear my voice and follow the live stream? Okay, yeah, good. So to the question I had asked, the first premise is false. It says all dogs are white. Now, is that true? No, come on. I'm sure some of you guys probably have dogs that are not white. I don't even know if it's the most common color for a dog to have a white dog. So it's false that all dogs are white, but look at just logic. The logic of the argument follows through. It is, this is a conclusion that follows from these two premises. If we just discount the fact that there's a false premise here, we still see that the conclusion is like a product of these two pieces of information. Okay, so that's why this one's not sound. Now, this one below is sound, though. I think, right? Is it? Is there any fish that can't swim? I don't think so, because <laughs> they're like, you know, aquatic life forms. I mean, there is the mud skipper, which technically can go up on the land for a little while, but it has to return into the water eventually, and they can swim. So this one is both valid and sound. This one's valid, but it's just not sound. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Sometimes you can have a valid argument, but it's not sound, because at least one claim in the premises is a false claim. Um, okay, good. So let's continue from there. Next, I have to ask, what is the definition of an inductively strong argument? Welcome back, Gabriel. Good to see you again. Next question, what does inductively strong mean? To have an inductively, now, not deductively valid, but inductively strong. Let me hear about this. <clears throat> okay, so good, Rohin. It means that if all the premises are true, then the conclusion is highly likely to be true. So with an inductively good argument, the conclusion is not guaranteed uh, to be true based on the premises, but it is probably true. So the premises establish a probable conclusion with an inductive argument. A lot of inductive arguments start with premises that make a reference to a pattern that has long existed, and then the conclusion is simply that the same thing will repeat in the next given case. Um, so if you can, let me hear from somebody an example of an inductively strong argument and maybe we can get a few of those to, to use as examples. So something that's inductively strong, an argument that has inductive strength, let me know. Like you can think about something that you judge to probably happen and then just give, you know give the reasons and the premises. So Rohin, you're going with the very the kind of classic um, textbook example. The sun has come up every morning for billions of years, therefore it will come up tomorrow. What if I, that's good, but what if I ask you to come up with a different one that I have not given you? Can you come up with one and be creative? Come up with a different one, and anybody else, same. I want to make sure that you're not just, you know, uh, you can operate with these concepts, that it's not like, well, he said it, so if he said it, that's an example. Can you give an example that applies the concept to a new case? Let's try. Let's do another one. But that's a, that is a classic example, and it's fair enough. But, you know, I'm a teacher. I like it when I can sense that people really got the lesson in their own right. So... Yeah, okay, Ashley. You say, my grandma's gone to church every Sunday for 40 years, and therefore she'll go to church this Sunday. Wow, very reliable track record. So she's almost like the sun coming up every Sunday. Um, there you go. And that's probable, wouldn't it be? If you've got a 40-year track record, then you would assume it's going to continue on. Uh, but something could happen. Um, hopefully not, but possibly something could interfere with this pattern. So we can't guarantee that she'll be there on Sunday. But if we had to bet, we'd say it's a, probably a pretty safe bet looking at the evidence from the past. Good. Violetta, my brother's made an egg sandwich for breakfast every Tuesday for the past three years. Now, is this really true? Or, I mean, I, I figure it could be, but that's a very consistent pattern with just the one egg sandwich thing. But, yeah, I mean, sometimes people have a standard meal in the morning. So if he has been doing that for three years, I guess he got on his hot streak of egg sandwiches three years ago, then you figure he'll, he'll make another one. Um, and you're saying it's a Tuesday thing. Wow, even stranger. But, yeah, okay. Uh, maybe you're making it up, but if you're not, then more power to you and your brother. That's cool. Okay, so Nicole, 
I'm going to run at 10 a.m. every morning for the past 15 years, and therefore I'm going to run at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Okay, good. These are all reasonable good examples. So that's that's clear. I'm glad you guys get that one. Um, now, let me just say this briefly. There could be inductive arguments that are weak instead of strong. And that would just be where the premises don't even show that the conclusion is very likely. Like if I say to you, um, my car got broken into like last uh, two weeks ago, which did happen, if you remember. And so I say, okay, so my car will get broken into again um, two weeks from now. Uh, there's no pattern there, right? I mean, a car break in is such a, such a random unlikely thing that doesn't, you know, <laughs> thankfully happen every day that you can't really make a stable prediction of it recurring if it's only happened once. Now, if it had been happening every weekend for like a series of months, then I might have more to go on to make that prediction. Or if I say I found a dollar on the ground yesterday, so I'll find a dollar on the ground tomorrow. It's just a one-off thing. It's random. And there's no like probability, um, let, let, you know, given to the conclusion based on a one-off case. Okay. So, um, sometimes people have inductively weak arguments just so that we can understand the difference. Okay, so now there are questions um, about different types of uh, deductively valid forms of argument. And there's four different forms of deductively valid argument that we studied. First, we're going to go over and remember the uh, disjunctive syllogism. So someone can tell me, hopefully, the format of a disjunctive syllogism. If you want to write the form, just number the premises like number one, number two, and, and label the conclusion with the capital letter C. So go ahead then, if you can, write the chat um, for everybody what the form of disjunctive syllogism. They sometimes call it argument from elimination. So how does that one go? We'll get the form, and then after we have the format provided, we can then uh, try to give a few examples of that. So yeah, disjunctive syllogism. <clears throat> Thinking about induction, like last semester in the fall, I was playing around with, um, we've had a peaceful transition of power every, um, at the end of every presidential administration over the past 200 years. So we'll have a peaceful transfer of power this time. That, that, see, there's induction that got violated. Um, anyway, so that just reminds you that an inductively probable conclusion is not guaranteed. Sky, so anyway, to our current question. Disjunctive syllogism, right? Either A or B, not A, and so therefore B. Okay, correct. I'll put it on the board one time, and then we can just see it there too. So here's disjunctive syllogism, DS for short, aka argument from elimination. And uh, here's the, f the format. You have a disjunction, which is an either-or statement. So the first sentence is either, uh, sorry, either A or B for some A and B. Then the second premise continues by eliminating one of the two. Let's say that not A, we've eliminated A. So that leaves us with the only other alternative, B. So if you have either A or B, and it turns out that not A, then we can conclude with B. It's also possible to have the other option. This is another possibility, either A or B, not B, and therefore A. Okay, so just the format overall of a disjunctive syllogism. Now someone, let's say, um, give a specific example that follows the form here. Just plugging in content for A and B. So what can someone throw out there for me as a disjunctive syllogism? Um, okay, so Violetta, you're either dead or alive, and you're not dead, and therefore you are alive. Okay, that's a reasonable example, um, true enough. Anything else? Let's get a couple more just to see if we can multiply cases. <clears throat> you're either dead or alive. You're not dead, therefore you're alive. Nice. <clears throat> what else? What else? Let's get maybe one or two more just to see a few examples. <clears throat> Anybody can jump in. I mean, a few of us have done a little more of the heavy lifting than others, but that's okay. <clears throat> like a disjunction of two cases, this or that. All you got to do is, the whole thing is just thinking of this or that. After that, the rest of it is just kind of automatic. It just follows a structured format. Um, so if you're thinking there, all you got to think is of like, what could possibly be a situation where there's two options that are possible? 
and then just start with that. <clears throat> Dead or alive, pretty creative. <clears throat> but other things exist, obviously. Other examples could be given, so go ahead. Nicole, either I go on a walk or I watch a movie. Didn't go on a walk, therefore I watched a movie. Okay, fair enough again. Let me just say this, though, and it's kind of just a, it's a minor point, but it's something that I think about sometimes when I teach this material on this specific uh, type of argument. Um, Veronica, your example is good. It says, my friends are either in the movie theater or at the food court. They're not at the movie theater, therefore they must be at the food court. I like that example. Um, Ashley, you're either with your friends or your boyfriend. You're not with your friends, therefore you're with your boyfriend. Okay, another good example. Um, all I was going to say is that, like, even though if it's on, if it's fitting the format, it's going to get all the credit that it's supposed to get. But just logically speaking, um, it wouldn't really be very much of a useful disjunctive syllogism if the disjuncts were like, here are two things that I would maybe do. And then the elimination is simply that you're not going to do one of them. Oftentimes in like, in real life applications of this type of argument, a person is trying to deduce which thing is the case and they don't know which one it is, but one gets eliminated. So like in your case, Veronica, that's like a classic example because you're saying, I know my friends have to be in one of two places and I eliminate one by like looking and seeing that they're not there. In the case where it's like, I could go for a run or a walk, I'm not gonna go for a run, therefore I'm going for a walk. There's no real like determination of the conclusion based on observing things. It's just, you make a decision. I'm, I want either tacos or pizza, not tacos, therefore pizza. But it'd be better if it was like, there's a reason why the one thing is not available to you instead of you just choosing it. Um, John, my brothers are either in the room or outside. They're not in the room and therefore they're outside. See, there you go. Clear enough. And we reason like that sometimes, you know, sometimes you're like on campus and you're looking for the correct classroom and, you know, you saw that like on the whatever um, identity information of it, it says like M, but the other letter is smudged. And you're like, okay, well, there's only two buildings where the letter M is part of its insignia. So it's got to be either MH or it's going to be whatever, um, some other building that has M in it. And then you kind of like ask somebody, well, that's not the humanities area. So now you've eliminated it, you know, it's the other one. I don't know, just give me some thoughts, but it's fine. That's all good. So let's continue from there. Next, I want to know what is an example of modus ponens or what's, let's start with the form. So there are three different, what they call hypothetical syllogisms. And they're kind of like family members in a way. What's the modus ponens member and how does the form of it go? So I'm asking for the form of modus ponens. And when you know what it is, just type it, and then I'll place it on the board for everybody as well. <clears throat> Modus ponens. Hmm. Okay, good, Nicole. So we have if A, then B, A, and therefore our conclusion is B. Right. So modus ponens, and P for short, for to say a little room. Um, if A, then B. A. Therefore, conclusion, B. Um, <clears throat> now, just a couple of questions about this type of sentence here. The top sentence in modus ponens is what is called sometimes a hypothetical. Other times, people call it a conditional. And... Um, so with a conditional or hypothetical, it's an if-then statement. Disjunction is an either-or statement. Hypothetical is an if-then statement. This is an if-then statement. Now, there's two parts to every if-then. There's the if part, and there is the then part. Let me ask you, what do you know about that name of the if clause where it says if A? There's a name for that little part. And what do they call this, if you can tell me? Something that was discussed before. So the little if part, the starting left half of a conditional, they call it by the name of what? <clears throat> so I'm asking you like about this little thing here. What do they call that element of the conditional? <clears throat> Just asking for the word. Antecedent, there you go. Hold on to that. Don't let that go. It's an antecedent. Now, second question. What's the word for the uh, then part? The then part of the uh, conditional. What do they call this one? So you have the antecedent on the left, if, and 
on the other side of the right, what is the word for this? Not the antecedent, but now we're asking for this part. What is that? Consequent, exactly. Okay, so good. Antecedent, if. Consequent, then. And um, I mean, the word antecedent in language, it just means like what comes first. Consequent is like what happens as a, bit, uh, as a consequence of the antecedent. Okay, so sometimes people call modus ponens affirming the antecedent. And they call it that because in the second premise, we affirm that antecedent, and then the conclusion will be the consequent of the conditional. So go ahead and somebody um, plug in some things for A and B, and just give me a real example now of this modus ponens type argument. So modus ponens type argument. Give me any kind of example you can think of. Really the whole game is just thinking of an if then. From there the rest is, again, just um, mechanical. So can you think of some statement where like, it just inc it includes the claim that if this happens, then that would be the result afterwards. So go ahead. If I watch this movie, then I will cry. Okay, sad movie, I think. I watched the movie, and therefore I cried. That's pretty good. It's elementary. Yeah, so what you're saying is if there's a movie that's like a real tearjerker, um, or maybe it has like some really depressing or sad themes, then you know just about yourself that if you watch that movie, then you would end up crying as a result. And so then you watched it, and then it, it crying happened. Okay, good. Uh, Ashley, if I go to the library, then I'll study. And so I went to the library, therefore I did study. Okay, another fine, reasonable example. I guess in your case, going to the library is just a place where you always are going to study afterwards, not just to sleep or to, I don't know, check your phone, but good. I mean, I guess that is what the library is for, to do, so that's a fair argument also. Anybody else? Maybe just another random example to throw into the uh, chat. It's always nice to have a few. But those are already good. Just seeing if anybody else has something that they want to add. Okay, so Veronica, you're saying this. If you study for the test, you will pass, and therefore you studied. Sorry, you studied, therefore you passed. Good. Okay. Um, and let me just say one thing. This is totally just a minor point. It's not a big deal, but um, you would probably prefer not to like number the conclusion at, with number three because it makes it seem like it's part of the series of premises that are listed in number one and two. So. Um, to offset the conclusion from the premises, I think it'd be better to like indicate it with a capital C because it stands alone. It's not just an, it's not a part of a series like the premises are. So it's like premises are numbered in the list. Conclusion is just C colon. Okay, good. So that's modus ponens. Um, notice this. Sometimes people make errors in reporting on modus ponens by messing up the order of the conclusion and the second premise. So sometimes people will write like, B, therefore A, but that's wrong. So I don't even want to put it on the board because it's incorrect. It, it has to be in this given order where the second premise affirms the antecedent and then the consequent is the conclusion. Okay, so there are two other um, hypothetical syllogisms um, which are called hypothetical syllogisms because they feature a conditional. Next, I'm asking you, though, for uh, <clears throat> the correct definition of modus tollens. So how does modus tollens argument go? That's what we want to ask for now. Modus tollens. What do you think? How does modus tollens uh, look structurally? And then we'll move to examples of it as well. Okay, so good. You've got, Nicole, um, if A then B, not B, and therefore not A. That's correct. Okay. So here I'll put it down. <clears throat> Same uh, to you, Rohi. Good. That's modus tollens. And um, modus tollens is sometimes also referred to by the label denying the consequent because of the second premise, which does deny the consequent of the um, conditional sentence above. So uh, with modus tollens, as you can see, we start off with one conditional, if A then B. We proceed to deny that the consequent is true. And if it's not true, then the antecedent is also not true because it had had it been, then it, it would have led to the consequent. Okay, so let's hear then anybody give an example of um, some type of modus tollens argument. Just plugging in things for A and B. So let me know uh, whenever you're ready. I'll, I'll see your examples. Just get a few of them out there. So again, 
Um, as long as you adhere to the format, you'll be good. And uh, I think a little stumbling block to get over is just to say an if-then. Okay, so Veronica, you say, if I go to the store, I need to get gas. Uh, well, you know, okay, this is kind of a little weird, though, because when you say I need to, it kind of reverses the logic of the conditional, because what you really mean is um, if I if I go to the store, then I then I got gas, not that I will need it. It's like if I go to the store, then I already, then I gassed up. Um, so if you say I don't need to get gas, it's not necessarily uh, implying that you didn't go to the store. What's implying that you didn't go to the store is that you didn't that you uh, didn't have any gas. But I kind of see what you mean. I mean, just formally speaking, it, it adheres to the format. It's just a weird statement. If I go to the store, then I need to get gas. It's like if I go to the store, then I had gas um, because it could not have been true that you went to the store with no gas in the tank. Um, I'm thinking about a better way to phrase it. If I go to the store, then I guess I need to get gas. I don't need to get gas, and therefore I did not go to the store. So why is it that you don't need to go to the store? Because if you don't need to get gas, then you already have gas. Um, but it doesn't make sense that if you had gas, then you didn't go to the store, because if you had gas, you would have gone. So there's this little issue with the word need, and that's throwing it all off. So I can't really take your example, Veronica, because of the word need. Need has its own logical uh, force, because it implies necessity. So it means that like, in order for something to happen, this other thing is a precondition that's required. And so it's just too confusing to parse. Ashley, if I go out with my friends, I won't study. But I did study, and therefore I didn't go out with my friends. OK, good. Yeah, that makes clear sense. If you go out with your friends, then you didn't study. But in this case, you did study. And therefore, if you had studied, you eliminated the opportunity to go out with the friends. Nicole, if it rains, the game will be canceled. The game didn't get canceled, and therefore it didn't rain. OK, good. That's also a good example. Um, yeah. Now, just to say this, though, Veronica, I would give you credit for that. I would still have awarded credit for it. But just in terms of it being like a pure prime example, it's just a little odd because, um, again, because of the oddities of having to parse the word need in the midst of a conditional. Um, because a conditional itself implies necessity. So the word need then makes it kind of redundant. When you say if A, then B, what you mean is that in order for um, B to occur, A would have to be a antecedent event. So if A happens, then B can't be false. Um, all right, good enough. Modus tollens. Keep this in mind. Sometimes when people make errors with modus tollens, they reverse the order of A and B here. Like they will deny the antecedent rather than the consequent, and that would be invalid. So make sure that it adheres to the given structure there. Okay, now one more is the chain argument. <clears throat> Okay, chain argument. So let's know about the format of the chain argument first, and then we can give a few examples of this. Okay, Nicole, if A then B, if B then C, so therefore if A then C, correct. Okay, so that's the way that a chain argument looks. It's all conditionals all the way through, even the conclusion. And the way it works is that you start with one conditional which says that A would lead to B. After that, B would lead to C. So what we can conclude is that if A occurs, then because it leads to B which leads to C, C will be an ultimate result from A. And so the conclusion is always going to combine the first step, the first antecedent here, to the last consequent of the last premise, which is this part. Okay, so that's how a chain argument looks just in the formal structure. And uh, who can then think of some example of this? Let's get a few of these put in the chat. <clears throat> Okay, Nicole, if I don't go to class, then I will miss the final review. If I miss the final review, 
then I will fail the final. And so therefore, if I don't go to class, then I will fail the final. Okay, that's a good example, even though I don't know if it's sound, because maybe some can pass without attending the review session, but it always helps, so good, good example. Ashley, if I go to Steven's house, then I will not study, and if I don't study, then I'll fail the final. Okay, you guys are all thinking about failing your finals. Uh, I can tell where your mind is at, but be confident. I'm sure you'll do fine on those finals, but yes, a good example as well. Veronica, if I don't work, then I won't be able to save money, and if I don't save money, then I can't go to Hawaii. Therefore, if I don't work, I won't be able to go to Hawaii. Okay, and that's another good enough example. It goes from not working and what results, not having money that's saved, and without money saved, person doesn't have that travel option, so failing to work results in not having the travel option. Okay, so those are all good examples, and um, the basic form that you're looking for when it's a chain argument is to just produce some kind of claim that leads to um, another result, then that result becomes an antecedent for a further result, and then we see the conclusion which matches the top to the bottom. Okay, great. So then um, let me ask then this, and then uh, that's this is the last question from chapter nine notes. What is the concept of standard form? Like what, I've been writing examples on the board in standard form. Um, I know that in this live chat, it's really not possible for you to do it because you would have to be able to get the return key um, like on a document that you'd type out in full. But tell me though, how does standard form go? Because you should be writing all arguments in standard form if you're asked to present any of them like in the final. Um, so tell me, how, how does a standard form argument look visually in terms of its presentation? Where do the different parts go? How are they um, spaced on the um, page or on the screen? Standard form. Like where does the conclusion go? Where do the premises go? You're looking at standard form right now on the board. So you can use that as an example to state the proper description. <clears throat> Okay, so Sky, um, the premises must be separated, the conclusion is found at the bottom, and the premises and conclusion are divided by a line. Exactly, yes. So, um, looking above at some of the examples, let me give a, uh, like, like Ashley's example. If I go out with my friends, I won't study. I did study, so I didn't go out with my friends. <clears throat> Well, this one's hard because it's so long that I can't get two lines in. So let me try another case. Um, I'll go with Nicole's above. If it rains, the game will be canceled. That one's also kind of long, though. Jeez. I'm trying to see, see what I'm trying to do is display like a wrong example where it's not in standard form because two premises just continue on the same horizontal line. But because each premise that I'm using right now is so long, I don't have the opportunity to display it. Um, okay, I'm gonna make my own. If I run, then I'll sweat. I'm not sweating. So I did it wrong. Look at this thing here and just understand this is bad. This is bad. This is not standard form. So why isn't it standard form? Because the two premises are not separated like this. One and then below it, the second one. They just keep running on continuously on the same ledger line. And that's incorrect. So you may not use arguments that are listed in the improper form. Let's try to get in the habit when writing out a logical argument of presenting the conclusion at bottom with the premises numbered and listed above. And the horizontal line is a divider that divides the premises from the conclusion. So this is good and this isn't bad. This is an example where the premises do not get divided onto two separate horizontal lines. So it would be the same thought as like when you get to the um, – end of one sentence in your word processor, then you would hit return to go down to the next available line below to add the next one. Okay, so very good, thank you. With that, we're done with all the early notes on just initial topics about logic, deduction, induction, valid forms of argument, and stuff like that. 
Uh, after that, the next chunk of material comes from chapter one. So a couple questions and let's ask these things. What's the Milgram study? Which one was the Milgram experiment? What was done and what was discovered by it? So even just a brief, you know, um, little synopsis here or any kind of reference to it at all that, that gives us a basic idea. Milgram, which one was Milgram's study? Classic social psychology experiment, often mentioned in these types of classes and also psychology classes. Uh, so the false electric shocks, right? Teachers, learners, shocks were not real. How far they were willing to go when authority figure says do something was the question that was being asked. What was the end, uh, end result? Were people very obedient or were they not obedient to the authority figure? Um, let me know, what did we learn? Because the whole point was to see how, how obedient people really are when they're being asked to do things that cross the line just because an authority figure asked them to do it. And uh, it could have turned out that everyone says, no, I won't do this, or that everybody says they will. So what was the result? Because <clears throat> this is like, one, you got to say the design of the experiment and its goal, so like what it was trying to determine, and then you would have to say briefly what the findings were. So how far are people willing to go? How obedient are people in general? Let me just hear it. I'm just looking for the last little item of info to complete this proper answer. Veronica, you're almost, you're like 90% of the way there. You just have to tell me uh, what was discovered afterwards when they, you know, did the study. Because like what you're describing is how a person would, you know, think of setting it up. Oh, I'm going to conduct a study where we're going to see how obedient people are by seeing how willing they are to continue following commands to give electric shocks when an experimenter tells them to do that. But now after it's over, what was the end result? People who refuse to keep going with the experiment were most likely critical thinkers. Yeah, that's true, Veronica. Or sorry, uh, Violetta. But um, but I'm asking a more general question. What was the ratio, et cetera, of people who either followed or refused? Were most people good critical thinkers or not? Do we not know? Is this the thing? What am I supposed to interpret from the fact that this is like an awkward silence? I mean, uh, it's a fundamental aspect of the study, what the results were. Most people were, were not what? <laughs> You're saying most people were not obedient, Ghazi? So you don't know. It's not true. It's over 66% of people delivered all of the shocks. Okay, good critical thinker. There you go. People are obedient to the orders. Two thirds of the people followed completely. Yes, that's right. It's not that hard to say. Just make sure to be clear. We want to be clear. All the information you have to expose completely. That's what I always say to people. Just blow everything out of the water. Go overboard. Do more than you think you have to do so that you have nothing to worry about, right? So if there's some fact or item of information that you're leaving on the table, don't leave it on the table. Put it out there. Prove what you know. Don't give the instructor or the evaluator any chance to downgrade you because you've given all the facts. Okay, so yeah, two-thirds of the participants went through with the experiment despite the learner's pain or at least appearance of such. That's right. Okay, next. What about the, um, let's ask about the Milgram, sorry, the Zimbardo study. What was the Zimbardo one? This is a different study with a different uh, design. Let me know how the study was set up, what the goal was, and then what the findings and results were here with Zimbardo. <clears throat> Zimbardo, anybody? Let me know. We're slowing down. We're losing our pace. It's not right. Let's keep going. We gotta go fast. Zimbardo. You have the study guide, right? You can look at the study guide and anticipate the next question. Like, 
if you don't have it with you and you're just waiting for me to ask the next question, then you can't like anticipate and think ahead to what the next thing's gonna be. So make sure you're pulling it up. But anyway, yeah, the Zimbardo, what's the study of Zimbardo? <clears throat> Is this working? Is the stream functioning? Can you hear my voice right now? Or have we become disconnected? I'm just curious to know because I'm not seeing any response back. Are, are we all together right now? Is my audio off? Is the microphone functioning right now? Can you hear me? So no, you can't. You can't confirm that you're able to hear me right now? Okay, good, thanks, Nicole. Just making sure. Because it's an interactive thing. It's an interactive forum here. It's not, no lecture. Okay, thank you. Good. <clears throat> so, I mean, in the first place, even if you just tell me something basic about the study, that's good. Then I know that you're aware of what it is, and then we can develop the details from there. But, you know. Okay, so Ghazi, Stanford in prison experiment, where subjects were uh, given authority over innocent people and the power dynamic was studied and revealed how far power can bend a person's morals. Pretty much, yeah. Um, I could add just a couple of little extra details. It was, um, yeah, that's good. So it was a study where we were trying to see the dynamics that would happen when people were placed into a simulated prison environment. And some people were given the role of guards. Other people were given the role of prison prisoner. It was supposed to be a simulated prison that was going for two weeks in the Stanford Psychology Department. The college age student volunteers were recruited into the two roles. But it had to be shut down prematurely after just uh, six days. Why? Because of the increasingly cruel, abusive, and harsh treatment that the prison guards were exposing the prisoners to. And some of those prisoners ended up reporting post traumatic stress, uh, all kinds of mental health issues and they were dropping out of the uh, study because of that. So it kind of showed that when people are given power, authority, and um, loose oversight, that they can tend to behave badly, especially when they don't have good tools of critical thinking. So yet again, it's a lesson that critical thinking helps us give the tools that we need to act appropriately um, and to properly exert authority if, if and when we have it. Okay, so that's the prisoner uh, experiment, the Stanford prison experiment. Next. Um, and we got like about 10 minutes to go, so there's still some time. I'll ask, what are the three stages of cognitive development? First of all, cognitive development in general is the lifelong process of acquiring intelligence and problem solving ability. And uh, the psychologist and researcher William Perry Jr. believed that there were three basic stages of cognitive development throughout one's life. So let's know the names of the three stages, and then we can talk about um, the definition of each part. So for the three stages of cognitive development, it went from blank to blank to blank. What are the three? Okay, thanks, Violetta. Dualism, relativism, and commitment. So about each of the three, what's dualism? It's the starting point of your intellectual development. And so at dualism, it's like the way sometimes little children think that uh, truth is all black and white and authority figures have the answers to everything. So all you're supposed to do is just listen to those authority figures um, not determine things for yourself, so you're just kind of going to receive information from these respected sources of information that know everything. So in the dualist phase, it's like, don't think for yourself, just defer to authority because they know everything and their knowledge is absolute. But then you get to relativism, and then you start to think, no, uh, there's no objective truth. There's just personal opinions all around. And so if truth is all just personal opinion, then we shouldn't really judge each other's opinions and just take them all to be equally valid. Finally, though, there's a third level called commitment, where a person will commit to their own views based on reason and the best available evidence. So now they think that there is objective truth, unlike the relativist. But unlike the dualist, they think that they can figure it out on their own instead of having to always listen to um, other people who they presume to be authority figures. So you would go from dualism to relativism to the more autonomous judgment of uh, commitment. Okay, and then um, from there, next question is, what is confirmation bias? Who could tell me anything about this? Confirmation bias, a type of bias that many of us have sometimes, we should try to overcome a little bit. But what is it? Confirmation bias. It's a person that only does what? That's a little hint to get you started. Yeah. With confirmation bias, an individual will only what? 
only seek out information that, well, that supports the things that you believe. You say for the things that you believe, I guess that's uh, one way to put it, but to be precise, it's only seeking out information that provides support for the things that you already believe. So it's like a bias in favor of confirming the things that you think are true. So like if a person, I don't know, um, was a fan of a particular policy, then they might go out onto the internet and just look out for a bunch of supportive arguments behind that policy, but never look at the contrary or the opposing arguments. Or if they think something is true, like a conspiracy theory, then they will just fill their head with all the conspiracy theory sources and information but never look at things that seek to discredit it. So confirmation bias um, is a biased way of seeking information which prioritizes the information that aligns with what you already assume to be true. And we should try to overcome confirmation bias because sometimes you know our initial assumptions are wrong and we have to be willing to challenge them and to test them against contrary evidence and opinion. So confirmation bias. Now the next point in chapter one review is all these different qualities of good critical thinkers. And um, so there's like a kind of grab bag of them that are condensed into one item on the list, but they each could have a separate definition. So qualities of good critical thinkers include things like analytical skills, effective communication, inquiry skills, flexibility, open-minded skepticism, and along the lines of skepticism, we talk about the method of doubt. And then another quality of a good critical thinker is collaborative learning and creative problem solving. So um, since there's a lot of content in the one item there, I'll just go through some of it with the last few minutes here we have in class. And then we can pick up next time, either there or later on into the list if you want. Uh, we can bounce around. Um, I'll also try to provide some additional office hour availability later in the week to give you guys more support for the final. Um, if you want additional time going over anything on the study guide or anything else. But yeah, so with these different qualities, let's say, um, <clears throat> Analytical skills, the ability to provide logical support for your beliefs instead of having unfounded opinions that are based on nothing. Effective communication, the ability to speak and write well, as well as um, listening carefully and being aware of different communication styles. Um, inquiry skills, knowing how to collect and present evidence for the purposes of research. Um, flexibility, that's the ability to change one's mind or plans when it's needed. Um, and to be open to alternative ideas, different ideas, not to just be so overly wedded to your own thoughts that you can't have a change of opinion or a change of view. Open-minded skepticism. This is um, a person that would not believe something unless it could be proven beyond doubt, but at the same time, they're gonna keep an open mind until such proof arrives. So they don't foreclose any lines of inquiry. They keep an open mind to all different sides, but they wouldn't believe something unless there was really solid proof behind it. Whenever people talk about skepticism and that kind of idea, sometimes we refer to the method of doubt. Now, the method of doubt is an idea that was first mentioned by the classical philosopher Rene Descartes, early modern philosopher Descartes. And um, maybe someone knows what's the method of doubt. It says uh, to assume what? Can anybody tell me how the method of doubt goes? Assume to be false what? If you can remember. Let's see if that one's somewhere in your notes or in your memory. Method of doubt. Descartes said, if you want to figure out what's true, then use this method. And in this method, you will assume to be false anything and everything that what? That could possibly be doubted. Exactly, Delilah. So what the method of doubt says, if there's even one shred of doubt or even one possible reason to think it's false, just go ahead, assume that it is, and continue on the same lines until you find something that can never be doubted. With Descartes' method of doubt, there's so much that he thinks we could doubt, even everything that we perceive with our five senses, because he thinks maybe we could be living in a dream or a simulation. But one thing that he says no one can doubt is their own existence because of the very fact that you are thinking at all. So even if you don't have a body or even if the world around you is a big illusion, at a minimum, you're a mind that's thinking. So that's something that is certain. Okay, anyway, we would never probably go as far with the extremes of doubt as Descartes, but it's nice to have some degree of skepticism in your life so that you're not just gullible and that you just believe things without solid foundations. Um, collaborative learning, that's the ability to work well with others, to find shared solutions, common problems, um, instead of just doing everything alone or refusing the input or the advice of others. Uh, and creative problem solving, being able to come up with imaginative solutions to complex problems 
Sometimes that is to improvise a solution quickly. Other times it is to already have contingency plans in place in case of um, issues arising or, or failures arising later. Okay, and uh, you know, that's like the first good chunk or half of the notes of chapter one. When we resume on Thursday, um, we can continue going through some more of that stuff or we can jump over towards the fallacy topics. Um, there's plenty of material, but uh, we can cover a lot of it on Thursday and we'll be through most of the list. And you can use whatever remains on the list that wasn't covered to guide your own study and to just determine what notes you should prepare for the upcoming test. So anyway, I think that's about it for today. I, uh, no need to rush right to the last minute, but if everything's fine and you guys are good to go, then just let's see um, and say goodbye in the chat and I'll see you back on Thursday for one more review session. Um, let me know, is that all right? Okay, thank you, Nicole, and thanks everybody for your attendance and uh, for making it a productive review session. I think we got a lot of good material covered, um, but we have a whole second um, installment coming, and we'll make sure to get as much review in as we can so that you guys can be prepared. All right, then, have a good one, and uh, until next time, take it easy, and I'll see you on Thursday. If you need anything, as usual, just you can email me, and I'll be in touch. Okay, then, bye-bye. Have a good one. Yeah.